Welcome to Friendship Christian Church, Friendship Ministries YouTube channel. I hope you are enjoying our Sunday School lessons. Today we'll be in Jonah chapter 4. It'll be our final lesson in Jonah. If you will, please let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just pray that you give us guidance, that you open our mind and hearts to receive the message that you want us to get out of Jonah chapter 4. Father, we just pray that we come to the proper conclusions as we go through this study. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in Jonah chapter 4, and we're in verse 1, and Jonah, Jonah has a complaint. He's complaining with God. Uh, but Jonah, this seems very wrong, and he became angry. It displeased Jonah. And that is strange because usually the preacher is pleased when the congregation repents. Nineveh repented. They received the message in 40 days, you will be no more. They received that message. They repented. They put sackcloth on themselves. Even their livestock, their animals, every, the entire kingdom was proclaimed to repent, and they did. And this displeased Jonah. He became angry. Not only is it strange for a prophet to be angry because people responded to the word of God the way God would want them to, but he was very angry. Jonah was very upset with his success. We should not miss uh, Jonah's intensity here. Uh, but Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. Uh, in the context of Hebrew, this meant that he was very, very, very displeased. His anger would have been so great. When he became angry, that meant that he probably pulled his hair, tore off his clothes, threw himself down on the ground, wailed and cried. That's that's the way the Hebrew would have displayed this kind of anger. And we read about that kind of anger in the Old Testament. We even see it once in the New Testament when the high priest rips his robe off as he's talking to Jesus. So he became angry. This, this is very angry. This is uh, the language in the original Hebrew here is very strong. So now Jonah explains his anger because we're not getting it. He gave the word of God and people responded. They repented. They turned away from their bad way of life. They turned away from idols. They came to the one true God. He was a very successful prophet here in Nineveh and he is so angry. So he, he gives us an explanation in verse two. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live." He's saying, I know your character, God. I knew the minute I was going to say these words, you were going to forgive them. These are Ninevites, God. They were a thorn in the side of Israel for years. They've been threatening us. Caravans have been plundered. They've been doing terroristic actions against us. They are going to declare war on us. They want to wipe us out. They want us to cease to exist. And God, I knew you were going to forgive them. That was Jonah's problem. He didn't want them to be forgiven. He wanted fire and brimstone to, to rain down on. He wanted the 40 days to play out. He wanted them to be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. And it grieved him that God had love for people like that, like the Ninevites, and would show them compassion and mercy and grace and would forgive them. 
That's what angered Jonah. So Jonah would probably be angry at me because I went to war with the church at one time. I went to war with God. I did despicable things, horrible things, directed towards God. And yet, Jonah would have me burned at the stake. And yet, God brought Jesus to me. And I received mercy and grace and forgiveness. I understand and have a love for the Ninevites because I can call myself a Ninevite through my actions, my past life. Jonah would have me killed. Thank God for God's mercy. I want to share something with you here from Jonathan Swift. Jonathan uh, Swift wrote some verses that maybe can explain Jonah's frame of mind. We are God's chosen few. All others will be damned. There is no place in heaven for you. We can't have heaven crammed. There should not be a place in heaven for me, is Jonah's frame of mind. It should just be for the people who were chosen by birthright and who live that birthright, who follow the rules. So heaven should not be very full. It should be just for the right people. Well, I'm not one of the right people. I'm not a Jew by birth. I don't follow the Jewish law. I don't follow the rules. And my past life, there was only one rule. Whatever feels good to me, looks good to me, I will do it. No other rules applied. There's no place in heaven for someone like me, according to Jonah. But God plucked me out and said, I will save you. I will have grace. I will have mercy. And you will be in heaven because of the blood of Jesus Christ. So Jonah says, but isn't this what I said while I was still at home, while I was in my home country, that I didn't want to go? Because why do I want my enemy? Why do I want despicable people saved? Why do I want them to have a place in, in the seven, same heaven I'm going into? I don't want them there. They're not good people. They're not the right people. So he enjoys mercy of grace of God, but he doesn't want other people outside of his little circle to get it too. So he says then, it's as he's throwing himself on the ground, it's better for me to die than to live. The repentance of Nineveh was so hard on him that he wanted to die and go to heaven now. Uh, not a, he, he, he says, if I go now, they're not coming. They're not going to be following me to heaven. Let me die before I see these people have all of the opportunities that I have. Let me die before I see these people all proclaim you as God and, and worship you all the way to heaven. Let me die before I see that. Because I'm telling you, God, these people are no good. So then God confronts Jonah. And in verse 4, God has a question that goes right to Jonah's heart. 
he says, uh, but the Lord replied in verse four, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah, why do, why do you have the right to be angry? Why do you have the right to be angry against me? Why do you have the right to be angry? Because I am merciful, because I am gracious, because I want all of my creation to repent because I want all of my creation to be in heaven. Jonah, what gives you the right to be angry about that? And God has that same question for a lot of folks. Uh, Genesis chapter three, uh, he, he, he confronts Adam. Uh, Genesis chapter four, he confronts Cain. Uh, Second Samuel chapter 12, uh, he's talking to Samuel and Eli and, and going, why are you doing evil in, my, in his eyes? And whom shall I send? And I say it's six. And here's a really important one in uh, Matthew 16. What do you say that I, who do you say that I am? And in verse 20 of Matthew, what do you want me to do for you? And in Luke 22, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? That big question to, to, Judah, uh, to uh, uh, Judas. And uh, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? To Paul in Acts 9. And so he's saying the same thing to Jonah. What gives you the right to be angry? And he doesn't have a right to be angry. Sometimes we get angry, don't we? Can you just stop and think for a moment of a time that you were angry with God? I, I, I can think of one real quick. I, I turned my back on God because I got angry at God in, in another life uh, so many years ago. I was 28 before I came to Christ. I was 15 when I left him for good. Those years, I was angry with God. I was angry with God. So, but is it right to be angry? God is our sovereign God. He is the almighty God. He is the creator, architect, caretaker of this universe, our very lives. Whatever he does is right. So if I have a problem with God, I'm the problem. I'm the problem, not God. I don't need to be angry with God. I need to pray that I can come to understand why I'm angry with him, because he's always right. You need to come to terms with that. It took me so long to come to terms with that. So the question is, should we even ask ourselves, am I angry with God? What do we do when, when we look at what Jonah did? You know, he's looking at it with a worldly worldview. He's looking at it as a uh, uh, knowledge and wisdom of a human being. And he doesn't see the far-reaching big picture that God has laid out in his plan. And our tunnel vision is the same. We see it our way with our paradigm with the lens of a human being, with our limited knowledge and wisdom, we see it the same way as Jonah. Sometimes we get angry. And we must come to God and go, okay, I don't get it, God. I, I don't understand. I don't get it. But please help me to get it. Please help me to understand that which I can't understand. I understand one thing, God, you're always right. So please help me deal with that and take away my anger for it's silly to be angry with you. And that's, that's what our response should be. And that's what Jonah's response should have been. But instead, he had an all-out tantrum. He went all out. And he was angry towards God and his state of mind uh, he didn't want anybody to repent. But now he finds himself in a place where he must also repent, right? He must repent from being angry. He must repent from hating his neighbor. Remember, 
Love your neighbor as yourself. That's one of the commands that the Jews received in Exodus chapter 20. Ten Commandments. Love your neighbor. Do not be covetous. Do not have envy. Remember all of that? And Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. That encompasses so much. And Jonah has broken that. He broke that command. He wants punishment. He wants death for the Ninevites rather than forgiveness. So he's got an anger towards God. That Now Jonah finds himself that he should be repented, but he's not repenting. Yet the pagans, the really bad people, the people who aren't the right people, they repented. And now Jonah's finding himself fighting God. So God prepares an object lesson now for Jonah. Let's take a look at verse 5. Uh, Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Okay, God, they repented. Now, let's see how long before they turn their backs on you. That's, I want to see that fire and brimstone come down, God, because this repentance is only going to last about an hour. So he wants to see what will happen. Then the Lord provided a leafy plant. We have no idea what this plant is. Uh, a lot of theologians try to figure out what this plant is. We have no idea. We just know it's a big, strong plant, and it's got big leaves. It's a big, leafy plant. And made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. Yeah, way to go, God. I'm, I'm cool in the shade. I got this big plant over me with its leaves giving me shade. And now I'm really comfortable to watch Nineveh burn. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die again. Yeah, that uh, The heat was bearing down. And what happened to my plant? He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. Again, Jonah's saying this. He's angry with God again. What happened to my wondrous plant? Look, I'm looking out over Nineveh. Those scoundrels, they still hadn't repented yet. And now my plant's gone. So God was doing something for Jonah, teaching him a lesson. See, Jonah's happiness was based on creature comforts, that great shade. And now the shade is gone, the plant's gone, and now he's, he wants to die again. He's very angry again. He's only concerned with the right now and what's good for me. What makes me feel good? He's not thinking broadly, godly. He's thinking so humanly. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant, but now it's better if he just dies if he doesn't have that plant. So now God actually brings application to that lesson. You see, that's what we get in Scripture. Uh, we can read the Bible through, and every piece of Scripture, we need to come to understand it through the grace of God, by the Holy Spirit. It's the only way we're going to get the understanding we need at that time. And how do we apply that to our life? How do we apply that piece of Scripture that we're yearning and learning to understand how do we apply that to our life to make us a better Christian, to increase our faith, to fulfill our purpose of living for the glory of the kingdom of God? How do we apply that? So God now gave him the lesson with the plan. Now he's going to give him the application. Look at verse 9. 
But God said to Jonah, it is right for you to be angry about the plant? Are you kidding me? It is, he said. And I am so angry, I wished I were dead, Jonah said. And God's going, you're that angry about a plant? Get real, Jonah. And, and uh, he said, I am. I'm so angry, I wished I were dead. Then in verse 10, but the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. Uh, first off, you didn't plant the plant. You had no idea it was going to sprout up. Uh, you didn't tend to it. You didn't pick bugs off of it. You didn't water it. You didn't tend to it. Uh, nor did you help it grow. You didn't plant the seed. You didn't water the seed. You didn't nurture it. You didn't nourish it. You did nothing for this plant except use it. But you did nothing for this plant. And you're angry about it because it's gone? And then he says, uh, and should I have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? He's saying, you're that angry about a plant. What about these people here? You're looking out over the city. There's more than 120,000 people there, Jonah. And they're ignorant. They don't have the knowledge and wisdom that you have. They don't have the scripture that you have. They don't have the nurture that you have. They can't tell their right hand from their left. And you're not, you're not caring about them. You're caring about this plant. You don't care about these lives. You don't care about their livestock. You don't care about anything going on in Nineveh when they didn't have the opportunities that you had? When I sent you, Jonah, the first words they had from me were yours, the words I gave you to say. And what did they do? They repented just based on that. They didn't have the upbringing you had, Jonah. But you're not concerned about these people. You're only concerned about the plant because it gave you peace. It gave you comfort. It gave you comfort. It gave you shade. That's all you cared about. It did something for you. But you don't care about doing something for me. You don't care about saving these 120,000 people who I sent you with my word, and that's the first word they received from me. You don't care about them. And so he's trying to see, trying to get Jonah to apply the lesson of the plant. And it is right for me to be angry even to death, he said. And that's some of his last words that he has with God. And he really didn't know God then, did he? even though he had, he was the right people, the right upbringing. He only knew what was good for him. And he didn't care about anybody else. He missed that big lesson. Love your neighbor as yourself. And people who don't have the word, people who don't have the knowledge, people who don't have the wisdom, help them get it. Help them come to understand God. Help them come to understand Jesus. Help them come to understand why they need forgiveness. Help them come to repentance. Instead of, well, I'm glad I'm not like those people. They're awful. They need to go to hell. Let's not be like that. Let's apply this piece of scripture, this application to our lives. Let's stop worrying about our comforts, our desires, our wants. And let's start worrying about those that are disenfranchised, those that lack opportunity, those who lack the nurture. And let's bring them Jesus Christ. 
to take care of all those things. That's what we should be doing. We should be concerned about those who don't know their right hand from their left. You see, God showed mercy. And he showed grace. And he showed forgiveness. And the, the real work of preparation happened in Jonah. Not only were the Ninevites impacted by the message God gave Jonah, but now Jonah's being impacted by this object lesson with the plant, by the lesson of, no, I won't go, by the lesson of, in 40 days you're going to be destroyed, by the lesson of obedience to God. We need to apply this scripture to our lives now. We need to be obedient to God. And uh, Charles Spurgeon was a great preacher, one of the, the greatest preachers of all time. And I want to share something that he has to say here. He says, I would suggest to some of you here who have to bear double trouble that God may be preparing you for double usefulness. Or he may be working out of you some unusual form of evil which might not be driven out of you unless this Holy Spirit had used these mysteries, mysterious methods with you to teach you more fully his mind. So here we had a double. Jonah now learned more fully about God and the people of Nineveh have now learned about God. So through reading the scripture, we can come to learn about God and we can apply that then to our lives and we can now live for God. I hope this lesson has been very useful to you. Uh, it's, we delved in a little bit deeper than the story of Nona and the fish that we've always known. But uh, please, please read it again. Please uh, pray over it as you read it for understanding. And take, take the lesson learned and apply it to our life. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in and uh, looking forward to being able to send out another Sunday School message on a different book next week. Thank you and uh, please have a great and blessed week.